I'm Baratunde Thurston, and you're watching Lenovo Late Night IT, where we lock industry heavyweights in a garage and make them tell us everything they know. I'm here to rouse you from your newsfeed-induced coma with some startling facts about cybersecurity. First fact, by the end of this show, there will have been 40 new cyber attacks. Cybercrime is now the most profitable criminal enterprise in the world. More than drugs? More than loyalty card fraud? Yeah, loyalty card fraud, that's right. So what conversations do we need to be having right now about security? How can businesses and consumers protect themselves? And what do we do after an attack? Curl up in a ball and cry, probably. Here to weigh in is Tim Brown, VP of Security for SolarWinds, where he's responsible for internal IT security, product security, and security strategy. That's so much security. A former Dell fellow, CTO, chief product officer, chief architect, and director of security strategy, Tim's got more than 20 years of experience developing and implementing, you guessed it, security technology. Now here's a fun fact about Tim. He and his wife live on a 60 acre ranch surrounded by horses and miniature donkeys. Oh, sounds really secure. <laughs> I'll also be talking to CSO Hall of Famer Andy Ellis, a 20 year veteran of Akamai Technologies. Now Andy led the company's security program, growing it from a single individual to a 90 plus person team. He's now the advisory CISO at Orca Security and the founder and CEO of the leadership development company, Duha. Did I do that right? Yep. Yes. But his greatest accomplishment of all has to be taking first place at the Sherman Oaks Galleria Spelling Bee. That's literally around the corner from where we are right now. So Andy, if you want to go pop over and relive those glory years, we understand. I'm hopping over right after this. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Andy, Tim. How are you feeling right now? Great. Great? Great. Great. Fantastic. So, a lot of security at the table right now. I feel safer already, and I want to know what keeps you up at night from a security perspective. I don't need to know your psychological issues. So many things, right? So, you know, large breaches, uh, breaches that are affecting the world. Um, really one of the biggest threats that we have is a true cyber terrorism event, right? That, that is what is really, truly scary. I'm duly terrified. Thank you. What, uh, what keeps you up at night, Andy? I think what worries me the most is how people don't always understand the risks that they take. Okay. And it's important that we take risks. We're not going to get rid of risk. I'm not the person who's going to sit here and say, don't take any risk. Okay. Like, literally, we showed up here. That was a risk. But the challenge sometimes is the systems we're using are so complex mm. that there are risks that we just don't even understand, but we think that we're okay. I mean, when you talk about the level of complexity involved and we don't understand it reminds me of the banking system mm -hmm. and that we had so much no one understood and when it collapsed everybody did that right yeah. is that what we're facing with our dependence on technology very, especially sim networking? very similar yeah. although i might even argue the it industry is even more complex than the banking industry okay but that's a great model to start from if we don't understand the banking industry and how everything is layered on top of something else it could be some company you've never heard of goes out of business tomorrow, gets compromised. When they go down, it cascades, somebody else goes down. But that's the price we pay. Yep. If we want to have this rapid advancement, yeah. you get rapid advancement by building on top of complexity. Right. And none of the software that we build is ourselves anymore, right? Well, but we have what do you mean by that? That nobody builds a full suite of software. We all rely on an operating system. Right, we all rely on subcomponents. We all rely on you know some open source components. We all rely on other things, which are really termed the supply chain now. Yeah. Right. So we're all relying on other pieces. So if some of those critical supply chain components have an issue, yeah. that's another place you get that cascading effect of failure. So we have like a software supply chain. Absolutely. A lot of people are familiar with our physical supply chain and how that can get pretty jacked up. I'm only imagining the complexity and the confusion around software supply chains getting... getting yeah, messed up. absolutely. And, and no software today is built by you know, an entity, a single entity. Everybody uses something else within their software. Okay, so we're getting really, really real with the talk, uh, and I want to pull it back another layer. What are the things that CIOs aren't telling their boards or their CEOs in terms of the, the threats and the risks that they're facing? They don't necessarily have full scope of everything that's involved in an organization. So just think about everything you need to know inside of a company to address risk. 
A lot. Right? A lot. <laughs> yeah. You need to know physical. You need to know logical. You need to know everything that people are building. You need to know every application that's going on. You need to know the little device that employees are that, bringing in and just bring adding to the, the door, network. Right? So you need to know so many things in order to you know truly get to a risk assessment. Yeah. I think they're not telling the board and others the unknown unknowns. Mm. We don't know. Right. Well, you know, what do you mean you don't know? Well, boards don't like to hear no. that. No. So <laughs> unknown, boards, boards want to hear either we're safe okay. or there's a disaster and I'm on it. <laughs> but anything in between those two things is a nuanced conversation that a lot of boards don't want to have. I think they're getting better. They're getting better. I think they're getting better and asking hard questions. Mm -hmm. Just really the unknowns unknowns. It's like, yes, we have risk in the environment. Yeah. I'd even say the known unknowns that just get filtered out. So the board asks the CEO, okay. you know, are we safe? Are we, let's just take patching. You know, are we patching all of our systems? You're yeah. keeping them up to date. Did you take today's 45 minute OS 10 update? Um, and the, the challenge is the CIO and CEO have to give a, a very short answer. It's either yes or no. But when they say yes, they're thinking, well, yeah, we're safe, but let me go just check with my yeah, director of IT. <laughs> yeah. And at every level, when somebody answers yes, they're filtering. They're mm. saying, yes, we're good in this one environment, which is 90% of our systems. It's what really matters. But the person they're drawing from was really only answering for 70%. Exactly. Yeah. Who's what they had responsibility for. Right. And so what happens is you don't have this complete coverage. Okay. So when you get an answer, you get an answer about the best part of your business. Right? It would sort of be like saying, is everybody in America fed tonight? And if you said, well, sure, everybody who lives in the you know, high net worth you know, right. locations are fed. You know, the places we're making sure have food. Yeah, they're all fed. But you're not answering the question about the people who are living out on the streets yeah. or who have food insecurity. We see that same thing within the sure. CIO framework. Yeah. Well, it also seems like maybe we should stop asking binary questions. Absolutely. <laughs> this is an right. analog situation, yeah. ironically. And that's why we stop talking about security and we talk about risk, mm. right? Security is a terrible word because people do think it's Well, security is a terrible word. It is a terrible word. It was like word. five times in your bio. I know, but it's still a terrible <laughs> word. <laughs> Because it means different things to different people. Right. Give me some, some positive examples of effective cybersecurity inside of an organization. So when we look at security, you know, good security means that you're talking about risk, not security, not in the binary, not saying we are secure, we're not secure. It's creating a education for the executive team to say, here's what risk we face. Here's how we can mitigate risk. Okay. Here's how we can appropriately minimize the risk that we face by doing these things. So that's when you start seeing a cybersecurity program that is you know, running well, okay. because everybody faces risk. Everybody faces some level of risk, so it's more controlling it, okay. right? Managing it. There's been a breach. How do you communicate that there's been a breach? Do you put it on a cake and have it delivered with dancing and all kinds of sparkles? Do you make a TikTok dance about it and hope they see it? And you say, I tried to tell you, what's, what's truly, what's the best way to communicate when something has not been secured. So I think it's really important in that moment to not try to say, I told you so. <laughs> it's hard though, isn't it? It's really hard. In a great organization, you don't have blame. What, what do you have instead? What you have instead is this acceptance that the organization failed. Mm -hmm. And you want the, per the person or the people who are closest to the failure to be willing to stand up and say, here's what I did. And they don't know if they're gonna be blamed or not. Yeah. And so if they're afraid of being blamed, they're not going to tell you what really went wrong. Oh, so instead, It's just like life. <laughs> just like life. <laughs> right? Right. So if you're going to feel shame for something, you're yeah. not going to come forward with it. Okay. So you I want them it. to know that there is safety. If they made an error, the problem was, why didn't you have a process to mm. keep a human error from causing this? Okay. Great. I want every human to tell me, like, they typoed something. Yeah. Mm. Because the answer is, I should never have a high quality system relying on human input because we know humans make typos. Okay, let's talk about trust. Zero trust. Yeah. Yep. What is it? You're explaining it to the CEO. Go. Yeah, sure. Zero trust means that you're moving your, your authentication and authorization to those edge, moving them out to the applications, okay. making the applications intelligent, making them make the decision so that you can segment your market your, your environment into little spots. The way I like to explain zero trust yeah. is a pomegranate. 
Oh, okay. The Cut. annoying fruit. That's the delicious. annoying <laughs> fruit. <laughs> so think about, think about the pomegranate. What does it have? It has the seed in the middle. It has a little gel coating. And then it has sections of gel coatings. Yeah. And then it has a hard outer shell. So your enterprise is actually made up of many seeds. Your Office 365 is a seed. Your AWS environment is a seed. Your on-premise workstation is a seed. Yeah. Your, all of those seeds, and each one of them should have a gel coating around the outside, mm -hmm. which is the security associated with it, and then a common policy around the outside, which is the hard shell. Okay. But if you think you can have this, you know, what we had before, that one monolithic big avocado, right? It's not an avocado, it's a pomegranate. Avocado has a hard shell, a big seed, and yeah. says, oh, I got firewalls around everything, and that's my environment. Nobody's environment looks like that anymore. Okay, Everybody's so, okay. environment is a pomegranate. You know, often you can't protect everything, right? You can't protect everything at the same level. Wow, and that when you, sounds so honest. You have to give up <laughs> land, right? You have to say, I am going to protect this much better than I'm going to protect this. I feel like you're a general in a war I don't want to be in. There you go, right? <laughs> so, so what are some misconceptions that people broadly have about cybersecurity, whether it's the nature of the risk or how it even operates or, or what it is? What do you think some of those are? So I think the biggest misconception is that it's a hard field. Hmm. It's actually a really easy field. It's really broad, it's really complicated. But it's like cars 100 years ago, okay. right? 100 years ago, nobody understood a car. Like, you had to hire car specialists. Right? You had to do all these things. And today, like, mostly we all know how to drive cars. Yeah. I mean, I live in Boston, so I know a lot of people who don't. <laughs> you definitely don't. But that's why I learned to drive, right so go. same page. <laughs> but we're in this world where security is still a maturing field. We're still trying to hire unicorns, people who can do everything. Mm. We don't need people who can do everything. We need people who can understand how to get part of the job done. People who've done safety engineering mm -hmm. in you know, water supply systems, they understand risk trade-offs. Yeah. Right. Like you don't get to shut off the water unless it's really toxic, but there are things you're gonna do, you're gonna make risk trade-offs. We need people who have that kind of expertise yeah. to come into security and make risk decisions. Keep going on his a little bit, the, the diversity of cybersecurity professionals mm -hmm. sometimes isn't as appreciated as what it could be, mm -hmm. right? Because diversity gives you different thinking and you absolutely need different you know, models of thinking to be able to do things. So for example, we wanna convince people that security is important and they should do the right things. Mm -hmm. So should you have a techie engineer do that or should you have a psychologist do that, right? Should you have somebody that can relate to people to be able to you know, yeah. help you modify behavior? Beyonce do that. There you go. Oh, Absolutely. If I could hire her Perfect. for that in a moment, they would all oh, comply. Everybody and they would wouldn't comply. click things they weren't supposed to. And they wouldn't to. complain. They wouldn't complain. <laughs> no. So, so that's one of the misconceptions that you need techie cybersecurity people to fix everything. Okay. Mm. You need people to write reports for you. You should be hiring journalists because they're really good they're at really consuming good. data and writing reports about them that yeah. other people want to read. I can teach anybody yeah. security if they've got some skill that's relevant. I need people who can tell we stories. We need people to talk like, and tell stories and be entertaining. <laughs> Hot dang. There you go. Find Thank you for the new job. Right. I appreciate you both. We are going to take a break from the interview mode that we've been in. We're going to play a fun and weird, slightly awkward little game. Are okay. you game? I'm game Absolutely. for it. Absolutely. All right. Now, IT experts aren't always the best at explaining their work in layperson's terms. So we created a segment that challenges our guests to describe what they do for a living in language that anyone can understand. You are going to explain your jobs to each other as if you're on a first date. And you'll each have about 20 seconds to win over your partner, and with any luck, you'll graduate to date number two. That's right, it's time to play Date Night IT. So, did you ever hear SolarWinds? I have. Oh, well, I ran security for SolarWinds. I'm sorry. <laughs> And you know that breach that occurred, that thing that affected the world that was on 60 Minutes? Yeah, Even my mother that. heard of SolarWinds. Yeah, so I ran security, or I run security for the company. I manage everything associated with that. Um, and yeah, it's an extremely interesting job. That sounds like a really hard job. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pause this right here. So Tim, 
Yes. Um, just look, I haven't been on a first date in a really long time. That was a bad first date. But I will say, starting off with uh, your most infamous failure, perchance. Uh, and not a good like, idea. I, it just, is that, just is didn't that, feel yeah. right. Maybe okay, anybody we'll who could again. get past that will stick right. around. Oh, is that how See? you received it? Was it like, this is a vulnerable moment? I mean, at least, moment. He, at least he faced up to it. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I still don't know what he does. Ah. Okay, so. All right, so I should try something different. Or not, like, should I run away yeah. Yeah, at well, this point? So why don't you give it a shot and let's see how. Am uh, I giving a shot on his or on mine? Oh, on yours. yours. It's your turn. Okay. Yeah. So I am like a landscaping architect for computers. My job is to help tell other people who are building big computer networks what's the right way to do it so that they can deal with weeds in a more sustainable fashion. Weeds being the bad things that would happen to computers. Sounds pretty boring. <laughs> oh, I did not see that coming. I was like, you had me on landscaper. Landscaping. How are they going to make any money landscaping? Harsh, harsh, harsh crowd, man. Yeah. Well, at least you know what he does. Uh, <laughs> All he knows about you is that you missed. <laughs> Second date or no, it's up to you. What do you think? Let's do it again. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give this a try because I don't know if anybody else is going to take me. So. <laughs> there you go. Thank you both for playing our weird, awkward, and sometimes fun game, Date Night IT. Here's an incident that a lot of us are experiencing directly mm -hmm. or seeing in the news or both. Ransomware. Yep. And, and I've heard you describe it as a self-inflicted wound. Uh, I'd love for you to expand on and explain what you mean by that. Okay. So many of our enterprises have this sort of flat monolithic administration model. So you have IT admins who have root access to every machine. Mm. So all it takes is for the adversary to compromise that root access once. So that's what happened in NotPetya. A number of places mm. get compromised because there's this accounting software that outsources it to somebody, downloads an update, it's infected. An admin happens to be logged into that machine doing something. Mm -hmm. Their credentials are stolen and your entire enterprise just shut down. Like that's a failure on our part as yeah. IT professionals. We should not be designing systems that everybody trusts the administrators. Right. When I talked about users having their laptop as part of their ecosystem, I literally mean we shouldn't have control of that from a central IT shop. Yeah. We should have it isolated so if IT goes down, at least our users are still up. Hmm. So when I look at ransomware, I look at it as a much more efficient business model. <laughs> <laughs> the shakedown uh, has evolved. Well, think about, oh, <laughs> seriously, right? Yeah. So when you think about it, what do you have to do before um, ransomware? You right? have to get in you... a car, get a gun, <laughs> go stick a place up. You had to get into systems, yeah. steal data, sell data to somebody that was going to pay for it. Right. So you had many chains oh, in your, your, yeah, your, your process. Yeah, your targeting your customers were different people. So now, now, now you just go in, <laughs> you, you compromise the system, you encrypt it, and you get paid. So you steal from a company and then force them to buy it back, Ex which is how hip hop works. There you go. black community. <laughs> it was exactly that. Good job, music industry. You're so, ransomware. So with that, right? Now, that model works, right? That yeah. model works because of Bitcoin. That model works because you can essentially usually get paid. They're yeah. doing a little bit better getting money people back. People are, are happier to pay but, than but deal with trying to... Absolutely, so you get a good payment. Now, the thing we're seeing, though, is ransomware is getting more sophisticated. Okay. It's getting to the level, often, of sophisticated attacks. It's not simple attacks mm -hmm. anymore because I get a $5 million paycheck. I can afford to spend a few hundred thousand to execute that. Yeah. And so that's our worry for the future yeah. is that the, you know, the attacks become more sophisticated, bigger paydays, and yeah. more time spent. Because these hackers have a growth mindset. Absolutely. So they're, they're all about business, all about growth, all about meeting their you know, fiscal plans. <laughs> now, what do their boards have to say? <laughs> Absolutely. To what do their boards yeah. say? Their boards say they expect to see 40% growth. Yes. So, um, and you're, I'm not kidding. How does uh, the changing nature of these threats affect how we keep up, Andy, and, and how we shift? So I think we keep up by hiring people who have different experiences because they'll understand that model. Like your reference about hip hop, like to you that was instant. To me, like I get it once yeah. you said it, yeah. but I never would have come up with that and said, oh, hey, that's a similar business model. Hmm. But maybe that's an insight that's helpful in the boardroom. Yeah, one of the things that um, we also just need to consider, right, yeah. is 
our new model is work real hard, real fast, all the time. Right, all the time. Yeah. One story somebody told me is they went went into uh, IBM, took over IBM, and there was a guy that was there, and he just had his feet up on his desk. And the CEO walked through again. He had his feet up his desk. Okay. Just, and it's like, what's up with that guy? He said, well, you know, last time he won the Nobel Prize, he had his feet up on the desk for six months. <laughs> so he said, don't interrupt me. <laughs> okay. But the bottom line is thinking right now is underrated. Mm. The time to think, the time to discover. You know, John Adams also, you know, if you look at, he kept a diary of every day of his life. Yeah. And in probably 40% of the entries, one word, thinking. So when we think, yeah. we often come up with new ideas. We think with, with groups of people. We talk yeah. about things. Yeah. And in order to combat, one of the things people ask me also very often is, so what's, what, how do you describe the adversary? Right. How do you decide the answer? And the word I come up with is thoughtful. Very, 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 very thoughtful. Not yeah. one thing was done that didn't need to get done. Not one piece of noise was made that didn't need to be made. Yeah. Not um, the code that they dropped waited 14 days before it ran. Would not run inside of our environment. Again, thoughtful. They attacked a, tr a mach virtual machine that goes away. It's not there all the time thoughtful. They didn't attack the source code control system because they knew we would see it. So they thought and thought and thought mm. and thought and thought. And we have to outthink them. Right? So you need time to do that. Thinking needs to be part of your program. Yeah. It needs to be part of stuff that you are dedicating time to. It, it's not a just about doing it, it's about thinking too. Can't think of a better way to end. Thanks for joining us in our garage for another episode of Lenovo Late Night IT, where you'll always get a fresh, unfiltered look at what's going on in the tech industry. And thanks to our guests, Andy Ellis and Tim Brown. I'm Baratunde Thurston, and I'll see you next time.